very warm welcome to our panel on uh, Global Jihad. My name is Alexander Brakel. I'm the head of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation Jerusalem. And we are uh, the sponsor and co-organizers of uh, today's panel. Uh, we have quite a tradition in our partnering with uh, this conference. And I'd like to thank our partners at IDC, uh, not only for this cooperation, but for our longstanding cooperation on all different kinds of uh, fields. I would equally like to take the opportunity to thank our partners from uh, the Institute of Advanced Security Studies at the University of uh, Kiel, Professor uh, Krause, who unfortunately can't be with us uh, today because uh, he's been essential in putting together this uh, panel and they've been a partner on, uh, uh, at the IDC conference uh, for many years now. Um, I leave it here and I hand over the floor to my colleague Niels uh, Wurmer, who's in charge of our uh, security think tank in Berlin. Prior to that, he's been serving in different capacities for our foundation abroad, handling uh, probably our most challenging uh, countries, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria. And today he'll be talking with his uh, guests whom we'll introduce to you on global jihad and what the West can do for fighting it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexander. Yeah, thank you very much, Alexander. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great uh, honor and pleasure uh, to be invited to this conference and to be chosen as moderator of uh, our panel on theaters of global jihad. What we are going to do is we only have 75 minutes uh, to get through this uh, topic. We will start with uh, Dr. Aitan Azani on the overall strategic situation of uh, Al-Qaeda and uh, ISIL. We will gen then jump from one theater to the next. We'll uh, continue with Jennifer Caffarella on Syria, Iraq, with Hans Jakob Schindler on <coughs> mainly Afghanistan, uh, with Aaron Zelin on North Africa, and then finally sub saharan Africa, Jihad in Africa with, uh, with Stiki Al Hansen. Um, as I said, what, what we are going to do is to highlight the most recent trends in regard to Al-Qaeda and ISIL, are they in their specific theaters or scenarios on the rise or uh, on the retreat? Are they cooperating? Is there a tactical cooperation? How did the military defeats in Syria and in Iraq in 16 and 17 affect the organizations? What did change in terms of ideology, propaganda, strategy, maybe recruitment and finances? And uh, as I said, uh, Dr. Uh, Azani, who currently serves as Director of Research of the Institute for uh, Counterterrorism, so our host organization, he will start and kick it off with an overview of the uh, strategic situation of Al-Qaeda and uh, ISIL. Please. Thank you very much. What I decided to do is to start with the, uh, a process that the two organizations work through. This is the process that I called it and the entire community called it from centralization to decentralization. And trying to understand the process of centralization to decentralization in Al-Qaeda at the beginning, and then going to understand the pro this process within ISIS. The main and the first major difference between these two organizations that for Al-Qaeda, this process took more than 15 years. For ISIS, this process took around four to five years. So the differences between two different uh, organizations. If we see the process of, uh, you can stop me whenever you like, it's okay. Don't look at the beginning. Wait, wait a minute. When you start to see the situation of uh, Al-Qaeda from the beginning, they started this process of uh, de -radical, de decentralization in 2001 after the 9-11 attack. And they uh, established during the years what we call the Jihadi Front in different parts around the world. Started with the Jihadi Front in Iraq, continue with Akim in the Maghreb, continue with Akab in uh, uh, Yemen, El Shabaab on Africa soil, then the uh, Indian subcontinent, until the lately they have uh, uh, developed uh, another uh, group in uh, Kashmir. And, Ayat Tahrir al-Sham and Khurasuddin on uh, a Syria soil. Meaning they were in a process of building a jihadi front many, many years, and this jihadi front operated, most of them operated as more independent uh, areas of operation. The second level that they entered, they were connected to affiliated organizations that they have a local agenda, like take for instance, 
Lascari Toeba, that carried out the Mumbai attack. They changed their situation from being local to being uh, uh, global. The next component that we can say regarding uh, Al Qaeda building this uh, uh, global network is uh, uh, Al Qaeda build uh, uh, cells or if you want to network, terror networks all over the world in a different areas around the world to build capabilities to launch an operation uh, in different areas around the world. And the last component within these building capabilities, this is what uh, uh, Al-Qaeda uh, did, inspired lone wolf homegrown in different uh, areas around the world. So we have a long process that uh, Al-Qaeda was uh, in, and they are still within this process until uh, uh, today, more than, as I mentioned before, more than 15 years in this, uh, building this kind of process. When it comes to Al-Qaeda, they have some problems of command and control, because we are, when you are building a global uh, capabilities, you need to build command and control system. At the beginning, it was Bin Laden until he died. Then it was the Wahiri that he had the problems of uh, lacking uh, a leadership capabilities. And then what we find out that the next generations or the first generations of the jihad, those that they were the founders of Al-Qaeda, most of them were killed. Uh, and even Hamza Bin Laden, the guy that they want to uh, one day replace Bin Laden, also killed, meaning Al-Qaeda has problems of command and control, and what they did, they mediate on these problems of command and control by publishing policy strategy of Zawahiri from time to time to the clip, and by inspired different groups to uh, uh, end cells to carry out an attack, and the, the people that were uh, uh, on the field, uh, meaning the leaders of the theaters of jihad, were more independent in their uh, operation. So this decentralization influenced the capabilities of Al-Qaeda, recruitment uh, capabilities, delivering the ideology, promoting the propaganda uh, of the organization uh, outside uh, the uh, area of operation. And we need to remember that headquarters, meaning the uh, leadership of Al-Qaeda is not in the Middle East, is more, most of the information uh, they said that these are operating in Pakistan, Afghanistan uh, areas. So they, uh, uh, because they were decentralized, they use a different technique to deliver their uh, messages and deliver their ideas and carry out some kind of operation. We call it today the opinion leaders teams. They build the capabilities of people that deliver the messages of the organization. This is uh, uh, Al-Qaeda that they face some problems to uh, adopt the new technologies like uh, ISIS. Going to the other side uh, of the equation, trying to uh, describe in general the uh, development of ISIS from centralization to decentralization, they started, ISIS started to establish secondary centers of operations even during the time that the caliphate still operate, meaning during 2015, 2016 onward, and they are continuing to carry out these operations uh, until today. Although that the, uh, compared to Al-Qaeda, the main center of operations of ISIS is Syria and Iraq, although the caliphate collapsed, but it's still main centers of uh, operation. But they build a secondary center of operation all over the world, inside in the Western arena and the, in the Eastern arena. And today we are talking about uh, at least 13 provinces of ISIS that are operating in different parts around the world. And they use the Al-Qaeda system to establish uh, a, a, classic, a clandestine terror network in every place around the world to uh, a, establish clandestine cells and to inspire homegrown and lone wolf operations in a different uh, area. They have a short process of uh, regrouping globally after they had uh, the collapse, and their command and control is better than the command and control of Al-Qaeda, and based on a new technology, the use of the new technology, the understanding, they understand how they, they, to use this uh, new technology, and you can find out within their publication that they have connections 
to every area of operation and they publish uh, their data uh, in, in uh, uh, their uh, media outlet uh, uh, operation. Recruitment, ideology, propaganda promoted by the headquarters of the organization and by the supporters. I stop here and I give the... Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Azani. You already mentioned the, the different wilayat uh, of the, of the so-called caliphate and uh, we are now going to, to focus a bit more on the, on the core of the caliphate and uh, the allegedly uh, effective command and control structure that it still uh, has. Jennifer Caffarella is the research director at the Institute for Study of War. She has been focusing on Syria and Iraq for a couple of years. We are uh, looking forward to your presentation. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, and thanks to ICT for having me here today. Uh, I'm going to be brief because we could do Syria and Iraq for all 75 minutes, uh, and we can't. Uh, so I will start with ISIS and give the overview of our assessment at ISW and then transition and say a few things about Al-Qaeda um, and hope to get more into that discussion uh, to follow. So we published a report recently at ISW on the ISIS resurgence across Iraq and Syria, uh, which we've been tracking very closely uh, during the counter-ISIS campaign. Um, but what we actually did was we re-baselined our assessment after the fall of Mosul and Raqqa uh, and took a conservative approach to asking how much combat capability did ISIS actually retain after the loss of those major cities because we didn't want to carry any assumptions about what ISIS would be capable of actually after losing their de facto capitals in both countries. The reason I mention that is because the assessment that we have I actually think is a conservative estimate of the ISIS strength across Iraq and Syria. And that conservative estimate actually reflects a deliberate ISIS decision after losing those cities to morph back into an insurgency in order to regroup and ultimately go back on the offensive across both countries. The phase that they're in now is the regrouping phase. They are reestablishing command control. They're rebuilding their sanctuaries or their safe havens where they're conducting logistics operations, recruitment, training, et cetera. Uh, in a manner that actually has been accelerating across both Iraq and Syria. The geographic zones where ISIS has been reconstituting the fastest is along the disputed internal boundaries of Iraq, exploiting security gaps that emerged after uh, the takeover of Kirkuk and the subsequent uh, crisis in Iraqi Kurdistan. And on the Syrian side, we've seen an ISIS reconstitution the fastest in the Syrian desert in the Badia surrounding Palmyra. Uh, in those areas, ISIS actually has demonstrated that they've not only reestablished effective tactical units, but they actually are campaigning at the operational level. So they have effective uh, command and control. Uh, Baghdadi has actually reasserted control over the, the elements that dispersed after the fall of Mosul and Raqqa. Um, and he actually conducted an internal purge to ensure that his organization would remain loyal to his uh, ideological agenda, but also that he could reestablish and re-elevate capable military commanders within his organization for the, the phase that would follow. So we are seeing them rebuild networks of vehicle-borne uh, IEDs in both Iraq and Syria, where they're detonating VBIDs in liberated areas. Thus far, the intent that we assess of those VBID attacks is primarily to demonstrate to the population that ISIS is still here, that it is still capable, and that it does intend to research. That is having a very important psychological effect because the counter-ISIS coalition has been very successful in taking down the physical caliphate, which is the mission that it was tasked with, but has been far less successful in actually enabling the uh, constitution or reconstitution of capable governance structures to replace the Islamic State. So in the absence of capable governance, we know groups like ISIS already intend to resurge and actually have an opportunity to exploit a lack of services and a lack of adequate security in liberated areas. On the Syrian side, we do have an ISIS resurgence in areas that the Syrian Democratic Forces control, but we also see ISIS expanding further westward, where they have claimed attacks in Dara and Damascus against the Syrian regime, and they are going hard, actually, against Al-Qaeda in Idlib province, which is perhaps the biggest threat, actually, to ISIS's legitimacy at this time. The Al-Qaeda affiliates in Syria, there actually are a number of Al-Qaeda-linked groups in Syria. That has always been true. Al-Qaeda's objective has always been to guide a diverse jihadist movement inside of Syria to replace what was originally a pro-democracy rebellion against Bashar al-Assad with a global jihad. One of the Al-Qaeda-linked groups, Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, which I do still regard as an element of the Al-Qaeda network, 
is governing Idlib province. This doesn't get a lot of media attention. It actually should. They are implementing uh, at varying levels across Idlib, but they are implementing their view of religious governance. And ISIS is attacking Idlib in order to discredit that governance, which actually does undermine ISIS's religious legitimacy, especially at a moment when we have taken down the physical caliphate and they cannot claim to be governing in Iraq and Syria. That al-Qaeda movement is concentrated in Idlib with Hayat Tahrir al-Sham governing and other groups like Haras al-Din using that safe haven to actually plan and attempt to execute attacks in the West. But al-Qaeda is not limited to Idlib. We also actually have indications of al-Qaeda, for instance, claiming attacks. Hayat Tahrir al-Sham has claimed at least one attack that I'm aware of in Deir Ezzor province, where Jabhat al-Nusra, the original al-Qaeda affiliate, had operated in the past, indicating that al-Qaeda is at least attempting to reestablish networks in areas that ISIS had held and that we have liberated from the Islamic State. I don't think that that yet is a very serious campaign with momentum from al-Qaeda, but it certainly has the potential to be that, given that the Syrian Democratic Forces has actually struggled to retain the allegiance of Sunni Arab tribes that participated in the defeat of ISIS, but aren't necessarily actually bought into the military and political structures that have replaced the Islamic State. So there are opportunities for al-Qaeda there. I'm conscious of time, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand over here in a moment, but I do also want to emphasize that the al-Qaeda movement in Syria has always claimed the most legitimacy because of its role against Bashar al-Assad. So the Russian-enabled campaign against Idlib province, where Russian special forces actually have taken over a very large combat role, is actually accelerating al-Qaeda's consolidation in Idlib. And it actually will likely stimulate the renewed, the, the resurgence of al-Qaeda insurgent activity far behind defensive lines in places where al-Qaeda has operated in the past, such as Damascus, but also potentially along the Syrian coast as al-Qaeda attempts to use that network presence to gain further legitimacy by hitting the regime hard and the Russians hard where they can, in addition to fighting hard to defend Idlib. In Idlib, Ayman al-Zawahiri has released a statement asking for the various al-Qaeda-linked groups to reunify into a joint military operations room that hasn't yet occurred. It may occur, um, and we're actually seeing that issue as a crossroads for al-Qaeda at this time. The threat to Idlib is very real, um, and they actually may not manage to, to prevent further Russian-enabled gains unless they do unify, and so that's definitely something to watch moving forward, as is the, the ISIS attempt actually to block that reunification. So there's an interesting coalescence in Idlib um, of these trends. But with that, I'll turn over. Yeah, thank you, uh, Jennifer. Uh, we are going to jump now uh, more to South Asia, to Afghanistan, um, which has been on the media uh, in recent days because of the failed uh, Taliban negotiations uh, with the U.S. government. But, uh, of course, among experts, uh, we realize that, uh, in particular, the Khorasan province of, uh, of ISIL uh, managed to survive there uh, against uh, tough resistance. Uh, Dr. Hans Schindler, a senior director at the Counter-Extremism uh, Project, based partly in New York and partly in Berlin, and the former head of the Sanctions Committee of the United Nations on Taliban, Al-Qaeda, uh, and ISIL is uh, going to explain us why the Khorasan Vilayat was able to survive until now. Thanks, Hans. Thank you so much, and uh, I just want to acknowledge my, the actual coordinator is sitting right across from me, and we'll hear from him after this panel, uh, so I all invite you to, to definitely listen to that presentation. It's obviously a great honor to be here, and um, when I was asked to do Afghanistan, Pakistan in, in less than five minutes, I thought this is a real interesting challenge, and so I'll try, I'll try to explain this as much as I, as I, as I can. Um, so let me start with the newcomer on the scene. Uh, you know, this is the old uh, uh, global jihadi headquarters here, and the newcomer is actually, in fact, ISIL. And the leadership of ISIL uh, in Iraq and Syria built this affiliate very purposefully for two reasons. Number one, ideologically, um, the terminology Khorasan that they use is a very important uh, uh, ideological part of the story, that the narrative that they tell. But they also um, saw the building up of a, as an affiliate in Afghanistan, Pakistan, as uh, a good opportunity to challenge al-Qaeda on its home turf where it, where it uh, uh, started to exist. Therefore, um, it did a little bit of a different strategy, uh, only repeated in Libya, 
um, than building up an affiliate. Usually it took the loyalty of a group that already existed or a faction that spread away from a group like in, in, uh, uh, in Somalia with Al-Shabaab. Uh, here they actually sent emissaries in 2014 who traveled through the country, six guys, um, to establish, to s collect information, establish alliances, collect intelligence, and then only in January 2015, once they felt comfortable enough, then they announced the existence of ISIL Khorasan. So it was a, a central-led built up of an, of an ISIL affiliate, and that's why this ISIL affiliate is one of them that they're not going to give up uh, very soon. Until the military pushback, by the way, uh, uh, started in earnest uh, um, in 2016 and then beginning in 2017, ISIL in Afghanistan got significantly financial support because it was such an important affiliate in, on a regular basis from ISIL core. That, of course, has, has ceased since uh, um, they uh, uh, got pushed back in Iraq and Syria. But the only other affiliate who got this on, in, in that amount and, and so uh, uh, regularly was ISIL in Libya, in fact. The high point of the presence, of course, was uh, by ISIL uh, in Afghanistan was achieved in 2017, where they not only had part of eastern Afghanistan a significant presence, but also in the north a, signif a significant presence. And since that time, the combined pressure of the Taliban, the international community, and the Afghan security forces, all of which went up against ISIL in the north, uh, meant that in 2018 their presence simply ended. They all surrendered, um, um, to, to partly to the Taliban, partly to the government. Um, so they failed in establishing a northern presence, uh, presence. They also failed in establishing sectarian tensions. Yes, they do regular attacks also on Sufi targets and uh, on Shiite targets in, in Afghanistan, but so far, luckily, they haven't been able to reunite the, the sectarian agenda in the way that uh, 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 Zarqawi did very skillfully in Iraq. So it's not a sectarian conflict yet. But in my assessment, ISIL in Afghanistan is far from defeat. Uh, you have to understand everyone in the country at some point or the other was against uh, uh, ISIL and fighting against them, and they're still there. Yes, the situation in Iraq and Syria negatively affected the group, in particular since they're no longer getting the finances out of ISIL core, but they still are in communications. So I agree with uh, my predecessor uh, speaker um, that there is effective command and control still, at least as Afghanistan is concerned, from the from the core. Luckily, the initial fears that now that Iraq and Syria, uh, the battle is over, all the remaining four, or many of the remaining foreign fighters, in particular from Central Asia, would now, you know, religiously congregate in Afghanistan is not materialized. So rather than hundreds or thousands of, of uh, uh, FTFs coming in, we saw a low three-figure number of, of uh, uh, people arriving from uh, Iraq and Syria at a very, very slow phase. Um, the second factor which I think allows a sustained uh, presence of ISIL in Afghanistan, uh, apart from the attention that the core pays uh, to it, is the connection to Pakistani groups, m chiefly among them the Tariq Taliban Pakistan, TTP, and the Lashkar i Taiba, uh, which forms some kind of strategic hinterland for the group across the Pakistani border, which makes it difficult for everyone to actually sustainably hit the group. Um, Finally, the ongoing negotiations, and I, you know, always being on the optimistic side, I'm only dealing with Afghanistan since 2001, so you learn to be optimistic to survive. I think there will be continuing negotiations with, uh, with uh, the Taliban among, uh, with the Americans, and there may be a potential agreement. However, this will mean nothing for ISIL. In fact, it will actually fuel recruitment of ISIL when the agreement is done. Last time there was a serious leadership challenge within the, the Taliban movement was when uh, Finally, the death of Mullah Omar was announced, and Mullah Akhtar Mansour declared that he's been actually running the show for the last two years. In that situation where there was a disagreement, and disagree, the, 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 any potential agreement with the U.S. will create disagreement with the Taliban, immediately you had break factions like the Mullah Dadullah Front and the Fidayin Mahas, who just went out and said, we have nothing to do with this Akhtar Mansour guys. Something similar well, it's very likely to happen, and then the only other place where they can find a comfortable home will be ISIL. So the agreement with the Taliban will increase uh, very likely the recruitment for ISIL. Um, finally, let me now address the Al-Qaeda structure, the ones who've been there all the time. And it's important to understand we are not talking about a Al-Qaeda structure, we're talking about four Al-Qaeda structures in Afghanistan. First of all, you have Al-Qaeda core, very small numbers, act as, uh, at most as advisors to the Taliban, as trainers to the Taliban, and of course then the leadership group around Sabahiri, who we all hope this time they actually are in the Afghan-Pakistan border region and not some built-up urban area inside Pakistan. Um, then you have all of the groups linked in Afghanistan to Al-Qaeda. The most famous ones are, of course, the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, 
who more or less self-destructed when part of them uh, joined Iceland, the other part tried to, to stand on their own, so they went from several hundred to less than a hundred. And then you have the uh, Islamic movement, Turkmenis, uh, Islamic, is the East, East Turkmenistan Islamic Movement, sorry, ETIM, which is the, the Uyghur movement in Afghanistan with about 400 fighters. So this is the second group, which are part of the Al-Qaeda network, but act independently from what Al-Qaeda core does, and actually stand under the direct command of the Taliban in the north. And then finally, um, uh, the third one is the Al-Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent, this new affiliate that Savahiri very skillfully announced just when the uh, uh, Islamic State was on the rise in Iraq and Syria as a clear propaganda coup saying, you do whatever you do in Iraq and Syria, we just announced an affiliate for the, the biggest part of South Asia that no one has taken care of yet, Al-Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent. And finally, you have the large network of Pakistani groups, Lashkai, Taiwa, TTP, Lashkai, Jangvi, and many others who operate inside, uh, in, inside Pakistan and create a quite a secure, uh, serious security threat for the Pakistani government, which, who tried with me, several military operations. You had Sabar Aspel between 2014 and 16 and Rat Ul Fazad since 2017 to push at least the fighters across the border into Afghanistan to reduce the pressure. But there are limits of what the Pakistani government can do, in particular now that the Kashmir situation is, is heating up again. So they will not be able to completely end the presence of these groups without risking a civil war. Therefore, um, this situation is not at all affected by the, uh, by the situation in Iraq and Syria. So while currently the Al-Qaeda network of groups in the region seems not to be able to take advantage of the pushback against ISIL core in Iraq and Syria, so they're not getting bigger or smaller, it seems equally clear that the situation in the region will continue to provide these groups with ample opportunity to continue their operations. Unfortunately, this source of terrorist instability in the region will likely remain fairly untouched by any potential agreement by, uh, between the Taliban and the US and the government of Afghanistan. Similar to ISIL in Afghanistan, breakaway factions of the Taliban may provide fresh impetus also for the Al-Qaeda network. And then finally, therefore, in conclusion, if we have an agreement, which will be extremely good, and we've never been as close to an agreement uh, with the Taliban before, um, it will unfortunately not reduce in any significant way the violence in this region as far as I can see. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for this uh, clear analysis, Hans. We are going uh, to shift our focus now from Asia to Africa. And uh, as the first speaker on, on Northern Africa, we have uh, Dr. Aaron Zelin from the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. He's author of the book or forthcoming book? Forthcoming. Forthcoming book, Your Sons Are at Your Service, Tunisia's Missionaries of Jihad. This is why we asked you to explain us of what's going on in Northern Africa. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And uh, for those interested, you can pre-order it on Amazon. Um, <laughs> shamelessly promote it. Uh, in terms of uh, jihadis in Tunisia and North Africa more broadly, um, you know, uh, for once I actually have some good news. Uh, usually when I'm doing talks about jihadis in general, it's usually bad news. But um, I actually have a positive story to tell today. Uh, so I would argue that... Uh, we're probably at the lowest point in terms of capabilities of jihadis in North Africa since the 2011 Arab uprisings. Um, uh, of course, uh, they're still stronger now than they were pre-2011, but it's nowhere near where it was uh, nearly a few years ago. Um, uh, so I think that that's something to, that's good. Uh, so what happened and why, why are we at this point? Um, one of these things is related to the anti-ISIS campaign. And I'm not talking about the one specifically in Iraq and Syria, but the one in Libya. Um, so for those that weren't paying attention or maybe forgot, ISIS actually took over a large chunk of territory in Libya as well, um, mainly based in Sirte, which is sort of in the north central part of Libya. Um, as part of this, they also had this uh, branch of a Tunisian cell that was based in Sabratha, Libya, which is about... Um, 30 miles east of the Tunisian border. Um, so uh, through the anti-ISIS uh, campaign in Libya, um, by December 2016, ISIS no longer controlled any territory. Um, as part of this, too, um, the camp that was in Sabratha was essentially cleared out. This camp was responsible for the external operations that took part in, uh, at the Bardot Museum in Tunisia in uh, March 2015, the Seuss Beach attack in June 2015, 
as well as the attempted takeover of the town of uh, Bin Gardan uh, in March 2016, um, which itself is a town that has had a lot of foreign fighter recruits from Tunisia that went to Iraq um, about 15 years ago, and then more recently uh, in Iraq and Syria, as well as Libya for that matter. Um, as a result of the safe haven being lost inside of Libya, this severely harmed um, ISIS's capability to project itself inside of Tunisia. And the network inside of Tunisia was never as sophisticated as the one that was based inside of Libya. Um, the main jihadi network in Tunisia that was actually the strongest was Al-Qaeda's, um, uh, and the group there was calling itself Katibat Uqba bin Nafi. That group itself um, has been degraded relatively well also. Part of this is through the process of the gover government um, in Tunisia as well as the military and law enforcement becoming far more professionalized. Um, some of this is due to the change in political power between parties um, after 2014. Um, uh, but also uh, part of this is due to assistance and learning as a result of this you know, through their democratic transition process. Um, based off of UN reports, there are maybe less than 100 to 150 militants left in the mountainous areas near the Algerian border currently in Tunisia. Um, uh, and since that report, which was earlier this year in January, at least 10 of the leaders in Katibat Uqba bin Nafi, as well as IS, have been killed by the military. Three of them were actually killed last week. Um, all three of them were Algerian. Um, this is part of the story of why Katibat Uqba bin Nafi has never really been able to break out in parts of Tunisia, um, since much of their leadership has actually been Algerian and not Tunisian, and therefore are not from the local milieu. Um, others is related to the fact that unlike other Al-Qaeda branches, which has tried to reach out to the civilians and try to build up social services and some governance, um, they've actually been breaking into people's homes and businesses and stealing supplies and other foodstuffs and other things. And therefore, there's a very negative attitude towards them in the Kasserine Governorate region, which is the main area where they've been based since um, they started conducting attacks there in December 2012. As for Libya, um, you know, one of the things that many who follow it thought would occur was that there would be some kind of rebound at some point in the same way we saw with ISIS in Iraq in 2012, 13, and 14 um, in the aftermath of their territorial, territorial loss in Libya. Um, thus far, while there was sort of a beginning of a rebuilding of an insurgency there uh, last year and earlier parts of this year, but over the last few months, the organization has been relatively quiet. It is true that they put out a video that's been part of a broader um, series of videos that IS has conducted from various elements in various parts of the world to renew their pledge of baya to Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Um, but the reality is, is that while the video from Libya was published within the last month, it was likely uh, recorded a few months prior to that. Um, and therefore, the status of the organization there, um, there really isn't that much information about it right now because they just have not been that active at all. Part of this is as a consequence of uh, General Khalifa Haftar's continued cafe campaign, not only um, in the east of the country and clearing up parts of Benghazi and Derna, um, but also due to other parts of his campaign more in the central part of the country, which has made it more difficult for them to operate in places like Sebha. Um, uh, in terms of other countries in North Africa, um, Morocco obviously um, has not really been that affected by the surge in jihadi violence over the last 10 years, um, and they've continued to maintain a strong police and law enforcement presence. Um, Algeria, of course we know the history of the civil war there and the rise of the jihadi movement there, which led to AQIM. Um, uh, but the reality is the Algerians have more or less been able to continue to maintain a control on this movement over the last decade or so. Um, one of the things that many worry about in the context of the protest movement currently there is whether AQIM would try and restart violence there on a greater level or try and recruit people in the aftermath of some type of transition. But even though they've put out a number of statements and urged people and cajoled people, there really hasn't been any sign that any of this messaging has worked at this juncture. Of course, um, in the case of Tunisia in 2011, 
there wasn't any signs that jihadis were involved in the uprising there either. Um, one of the original sins of the revolution, though, was in the aftermath of the transition, is that there was an amnesty for all prisoners, not just political prisoners, but also those who were involved in actual terrorism. And this provided a base for rebuilding some structure in Tunisia. So if I was Algeria and they do shuffle some decks in terms of the political leaders, obviously the process has been a lot slower and longer in Algeria in comparison to it only taking about three weeks in Tunisia. Um, one advice would be do not release jihadi prisoners even if they were arrested or taken under an authoritarian regime. If you're worried about the rule of law, then retry them. Don't just let them out and see what happens next because we already know what will happen. Um, and I would say something similar to Sudan, though that's not technically North Africa per se, maybe um, Stig can touch upon that at all. But similarly, we haven't seen any signs that they've been able to take advantage there as well. And I don't know if I've speak, spoken for five minutes, so I'll leave it at that. Yeah, thank you, uh, Aaron. Thanks for this uh, analysis. Uh, finally, in the, uh, our first round, we are now focusing on the probably biggest region uh, in terms of size, uh, sub saharan Africa. Uh, Professor Stikja Lahansen uh, from the Norwegian University of Life Sciences is head of the IR program over there, has been focusing on Africa for decades with a strong focus on, uh, on Somalia. He's author of the recently published book, Horn, Sahel and Rift, Four Lines of the African Jihad. And we are very much looking forward uh, to your presentation, Stig. Thank you. It's a big pleasure of uh, being here, although having uh, the obligation to speak about a quite uh, serious uh, topic. Um, I would have wished that I had uh, such uh, good news as the fellow on my side here. Uh, I, my news are a little bit more stable and a little bit no more negative. If you look at uh, sub-Saharan Africa, you can say that there are some general lines that we should keep in mind. Uh, also when it comes to the uh, tension between the Islamic State and the uh, Al-Qaeda affiliates. Basically, the Al-Qaeda affiliates that were there before the rise of the Islamic State, they have proven themselves to be stable and loyal towards Al-Qaeda Central. Uh, they have also proven themselves to be rather locally focused. Uh, so if they, for example, hit that Western, or indeed uh, also they have a potential to hit that Israeli target, it will be in a regional uh, level. It will not be that they, for example, hit in Western Europe. But they can hit Western targets uh, at a regional level. Um, there's a lot of uh, talk about these uh, more stable affiliates as being on the decline. I can tell you that they are not on the decline. Um, if you go to the Harakat al-Shabaab, for example, today uh, they are better able to tax inside Somalia than they ever were before. Uh, Mogadishu is supposedly controlled by the government, but uh, Shabab taxing is widespread. We can also see that they put up alternative systems of governance, even within the city of Mogadishu. So they have alternative courts, etc., etc. So the Harakat al Shabab today, I would uh, deem, are more rich. They are richer and financially stronger than they ever been. Uh, they have been pressured militarily. Uh, but traditionally, Shebab have provided themselves with some kind of refugee in the countryside. Uh, when they are exposed to a military offensive, they usually withdraw and uh, nobody uh, actually uh, provides security to the local villages, so they will prey upon the local villagers. Uh, and this is seen in many African cases, in fact. So local security has been uh, an essential lack in the past. Some of you might have read that there is a big government offensive going on in Shabayla. Uh, no, uh, my suspicion is that you will have the same situation, that they will probably win some of the local battles, then they will withdraw from the villages, and the Shabab will be able to tax at local level and integrate with the local villages. There is also a standing tension in Somalia between... Um, between the Shabab and uh, also, uh, not the Shabab, but the government and the regional states. Uh, we have seen a tendency over the last one and a half year where the government is actually uh, removing uh, opposition. 
and uh, these have grown into a conflict that has uh, clan dimensions as well. And we see now that the Shebab can ride on this and uh, recruit amongst the disgruntled clans. So this ensures some stability. On the positive side in Somalia, it seems like the Somali army have been getting slightly better. And there have been some pressure from the American offensive there. But as I said, you know, Shebab inside Somalia are richer than ever. Um, uh, secondly, uh, on the more positive side is the Kenyan efforts and the Tanzanian efforts to strike down on related networks in their country. And it seems actually that Kenya and Tanzania have been relatively successful in striking down. They also had a large returning foreign fighter problem that has been neglected by the world. Uh, basically, a lot of uh, Kenyans and Tanzanians fought within the Shebab. Uh, the amnesty regulations in the two countries have been rather unclear, but there have been progress in the counter-terrorist work inside the countries. And uh, it seems like they are stronger now, although they had this uh, Dusit attack in Nairobi, it was handled much better than, for example, the Westgate attack. So the region around Somalia is growing stronger. But for the people who claim that the Shebab is on the decline, ladies and gentlemen, I ask you to be a little bit skeptic towards that claim. Um, if you go to the older long-standing Al-Qaeda network in the sub-Saharan Africa, which is basically the JNIM, uh, JNIM resembles the Shebab a little bit in one sense. It's, uh, it's more of an alliance, but it's based around older Al-Qaeda structures. Uh, and JNIM is in a phase that leaves it a slightly weaker than Al-Qaeda, but it has some kind of potential. Uh, it still is able to implement operations in northern Mali. It has been a lot of talk about uh, JNIM expansion into the central Mali region, the Mopti region. And uh, this may be illustrating another point when it comes to discussing West African jihadists. Basically, the tension between uh, local uh, farmers and local nomads that is sometimes taken advantage of by uh, uh, jihadists. But still, this conflict between local farmers and, and uh, local herders are dominated by just uh, local conflict dynamics in Mopti. So the uh, jihadists haven't fully taken over the conflict dynamic yet. It's still ongoing, and still ethnic tensions are perhaps more dominating than uh, jihadists. What is to be watched when it comes to JNIM, and that's rather serious, it's signs that you have some kind of JNIM expansion into Burkina Faso. Another attack happened yesterday, quite recent, and you can see an increased focus on the attack uh, patterns than probably through the uh, local partner in, in the Mopti region, the Makina Liberation Front, in Burkina Faso. So there's a spread. And we should also uh, keep in mind that one of the local uh, jihadist readers in Burkina Faso have been quite strong and eloquent uh, when he talked about the Islamic State. So there seem to be some kind of sympathies within some of the local ranks there against the Islamic State. But these two uh, older affiliates of Al-Qaeda have been stable and uh, have prevented basically Islamic State infringements. If you talk about Shebab and you talk about Jainim, the Islamic State uh, basically affiliates, which is uh, the Islamic State in East Africa and the Islamic State in Greater Sahara, are basically on the fringe. They are on the periphery. They are just being allowed to exist very heavily pressured by the uh, Al-Qaeda affiliates and I would say are not really impressive in structure. They are kind of struggling. Uh, where the Islamic State had some successes in Africa were with the jihadist organizations that weren't affiliated with Al-Qaeda, basically Boko Haram in Nigeria, but also the kind of mysterious, it seems, uh, allied de democratic forces inside Congo. Uh, and allied democratic forces uh, ha is a very strange movement and uh, in fact it's more research on that organization has been needed, uh, is still needed in fact. Um, it's one of the oldest, it was established as early as in 1995 around uh, uh, Ugandan, uh, uh, basically Salafis and uh, a local uh, uh, insurgency organization in the mountains in the border between Congo and uh, Uganda. And it seems like their inclinations towards jihadism have varied over time. You know, at times they have been relatively secular, at times they have been become more jihadists. And what we have seen as of late from 2017 and onwards is really that uh, there was a pledge locally towards the Islamic State we didn't really know if that was fully the ADF or just part of the ADF, that it actually fragmented. 
but we have seen more and more uh, circulation of uh, basically claims of attacks coming out of what is called the Islamic State of Central Africa, basically. So it has been an increase in the uh, amount of attacks that have been claimed by uh, the local Islamic State affiliate inside Congo. And ADF is hard to estimate strength-wise. Some observers say that it's as low as 200 people, but they still manage to put their mark in the Kivu. And furthermore, the links from Congo down to Mozambique have created another phenomenon that we have seen as of late that are quite interesting. Basically, the Islamic State in June claiming one attack in Mozambique, and uh, it's clearly it's a, a new organization in Mozambique, al Sunna wal Jamaa, who is in existence, and it might be that parts of it has wore some kind of allegiance, and interestingly enough, not towards uh, anything to the, alongside the coast, but towards this Islamic State in uh, Central Africa. So there's a kind of linkage there, and this is fluid, and it's something new, and something uh, relatively uh, important to be watched in the future. We don't know how this will end up, and there's some kind of potential there that we need to follow. Inside Nigeria, that we spoke about during the last session, we saw that there was uh, some kind of uh, uh, regional cooperation and that uh, uh, the remains of the Boko Haram, the two organizations, uh, Shekau, uh, Abu Bakr Shekau's fraction, who is uh, located closer to the Sambisa forest, still is relatively friendly towards the Islamic State, but not accepted by the Islamic State. And the so-called Barnabi fraction, Islamic State in Western Africa, basically, who is fully accepted by the Islamic State. Uh, at the start, being driven away from certain cities. But what we've seen over the last month is a little bit sad. It's basically an offensive where you now have, uh, especially Islamic State in Western Africa, controlling territories again, like Baga City, uh, like several other cities in, in Borno. So they're actually on the, uh, expanding. Uh, we have seen clashes between the Shakao uh, fraction and the Islamic State in the West Africa fraction, but it also seems like the Shakao fraction has reconsolidated themselves to a certain extent and now are back in control over part of the Sambisa area. So uh, both of these fractions are actually on the offensive uh, as we speak. Um, uh, I think some of the mechanisms here is similar to the Shabab. You know, when they are beaten, they usually transform themselves into some kind of insurgency, and local security of local villages, to a certain extent, is neglected. And um, uh, then um, they can tax local villages, and they can survive. Uh, I think one of the losses with Boko Haram uh, in the past is that the international community has underestimated it seriously. Uh, both of the fractions are much more advanced than people give them credit for. And during our field research in the area, we saw incidences where, for example, uh, both fractions acted as some kind of lenders for local enterprises, investing into local enterprises to gain some kind of um, income from that. Uh, but the main lesson here is that uh, Boko Haram currently is on the offensive again. Both fractions, old fractions, so both the Islamic State in West Africa and Shekau fraction are on the offensive. Uh, Abu Bakr Shekau released a video a couple of uh, days ago uh, and, um, to show his own health. So he is still around and, and uh, re-establishing his own fraction. But we will also see how these clashes between the two fractions, what it leads to. Uh, if we want to sum up, basically, you can see that there's some kind of fluidity when it comes to the Islamic State uh, affiliates, that the, peop uh, the old organizations that have morphed into some kind of Islamic State uh, affiliates, they are more on the offensive than the old Al-Qaeda affiliates, but the old Al-Qaeda affiliates are also relatively stable. Something in common for all of this is some kind of local focus, but we shouldn't forget that they, you still have the international networks, so some of these organizations can provide some kind of logistic support. And Shebab also have a very efficient media sector, and in the media outlets, they are publishing English videos that targets the West. So there are some global list rhetoric from the media section that might have some influence in the West as well. I think that's uh, pretty much uh, summing up the whole continent of Africa, which is not easy in five minutes. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Stick, for this sound analysis. Ladies and gentlemen, we have some 21 uh, minutes left, and uh, there, 
there is many aspects that we could discuss now in more detail, but I would like to, to focus on one particular aspect that we might have indirectly touched already, but uh, not that explicitly. And this is, as uh, Western societies, uh, there is still a strong thirst for reducing our involvement in Afghanistan, in Iraq, uh, to, to get out of there, and the question of what, what might uh, happen then. And uh, one, one question uh, for, for our decision makers in, in, in Europe and, of course, in the U.S. is uh, which of the affiliates is the most dangerous one? Is an al-Qaeda or ISIL attack in Europe or the U.S. likely? Do they still want to attack us or is this priority number whatever right now? And my first question, of course, in this regard would go to either Dr. Azani or uh, to, to Hans uh, Jakob. Um, is Al-Qaeda and, uh, and Daesh now uh, occupied with, with other priorities? Uh, or uh, what, what do we have to expect in this regard? What would you recommend European or US decision makers where, where to focus on, where to have an eye on? Is it Yemen, is it Libya, is it still Afghanistan or Syria, Iraq? If, if we could address this, would be... You, you want to start? Yes, I want to start, and uh, my view is that uh, work assumptions of every security agency or every state, that these organizations, Al-Qaeda and Daesh, want at the end of the day to uh, enforce Islam all over the world. This is the vision. If it, this is the vision, you need to build your capabilities to counter this uh, a vision on one hand and to deal with every component of the vision on the ground. Because at the end of the day, what we are doing in most cases, we are dealing with a phenomenon that already in process. And uh, if I look on the situation, uh, let's say for instance in Europe during the last uh, year and a half or two years, there is a high decrease with the phenomenon of terror attacks in Europe because uh, a lot of uh, reasons to this decrease. It doesn't say that the global jihadists decided that they are not focusing now on the uh, Western societies or to uh, operate in this field. So for every security agency, uh, the work assumption should be we need to address every threat from every angle of these organizations because they don't want to stay in a place, in a peaceful place, you know, only in the Middle East or in their tribe. What they want is beyond it. We saw it with the caliphate that we surprised how they fast they establish a caliphate and what is the idea. We saw it with the uh, uh, seven phases strategy of Al Qaeda that in the eyes of Al Qaeda in 2020 they will rule the world. So this is, is always within their strategy. So we need to be prepared. We need to uh, be able to see all the levels that bring people to this field, meaning taking radicalization process from the early phase, because these people at the end of the day can operate on the Western arena and can operate also in the Middle East. This means from your point of view the, the threat is reduced but not over at all. The threat is reduced. This is a very nice way to say it because if I'm now, you know, in a security agency, I say it is reduced, let's take my power to another angle. The, the threat is still there and we need to be prepared. And, okay, please. Sure. Yeah. So uh, briefly on uh, the al-Qaeda front, um, ISIS is still in, intends to attack the West. They're continuing uh, to resource those efforts. Um, but I think the al-Qaeda aspect of this in Syria is important uh, to keep into focus. It has become sort of vogue to perceive Hayat Tahrir al-Sham and Abu Muhammad Jalani as having gone local and therefore as less of a threat to the West because they're not immediately planning attacks. And I think that this is a very big mistake. Um, I think it's actually a bit naive to assume that this organization has meaningfully changed its long-term view, which it certainly has not, and to underestimate the threat of allowing Abu Muhammad al-Jalani to continue to be the leader of the most capable military force fighting in the most internationalized war on earth. He does have a long-term vision to create an Islamic Emirate inside of Syria. It is, in his view, an essential requirement for the global jihad, which he is knowingly fighting. Al-Qaeda in Syria, through Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, not just Haras al-Din, 
is conducting global foreign fighter recruitment. We don't talk about this enough. They're actually focusing very actively on recruiting fighters from Germany. And they've sent out a call, not only for new mobilization inside of Syria, and not only for new foreign fighters to come to Idlib to fight the Russians and the Assad regime and the Iranians, but they've even put out a call for Syrian refugees to return, to participate in the jihad. Hayat Tahrir al-Sham claims that this has already begun. This is, a ve- this is actually a sea change, in my view. And the more latitude that, he- that Jelani and this organization has to position themselves as a mainstream or in some way acceptably local organization, we are going to face an even bigger threat in the future. And my concern is that we're going to look back five years from now, a decade from now, and say, holy cow, why did we not act sooner? Why did we not act before these al-Qaeda leaders convinced a generation of Syrians, actually, that what was necessary to defend themselves was not just a war against Bashar al-Assad, but a global jihad? We can still take preventative action. I think it's imperative that we recognize this threat early rather than far too late after additional lives have been lost. Yeah, thanks. Uh, just before we uh, give it to Hans, one, one other question in this regard, uh, Jennifer. Because as far as I understand, you, think, you say Al-Qaeda is much more dangerous right now in regard to Syria. And before you said that Daesh is channeling resources to fight uh, Al-Qaeda or Hayat al Asham in Idlib. So are they that self-confident not to focus on surviving somewhere in the Syrian desert, the, the ongoing offensives by the, by the Syrian government? ISIS? That, ISIS. That they can focus on fighting uh, Al-Qaeda? Yeah, right. So ISIS has been resourcing um, a campaign against al-Qaeda since actually before Raqqa fell. Um, Actually, since they entered Syria, ISIS has been trying to edge out al-Qaeda. They are confident enough, actually, to devote resources to Idlib. I have my suspicions about who might be enabling that campaign in Idlib, which does benefit the Russians and the Assad regime by weakening defenses in Idlib. Um, But yeah, ISIS is actually quite strong across Iraq and Syria. It's not gaining that many headlines because... Time is on their side, ISIS is, and they know it. Um, but they are targeting Idlib in part, I expect, to try to outcompete Al Qaeda for foreign fighters. Um, and because Idlib is connected to the Turkish border and provides ISIS thereby an avenue um, into and out of Syria, that is more difficult for them actually to achieve farther east. But the level of the ISIS resurgence in Syria really can't be understated because their will is strong. Um, they, they're keeping a relatively low profile, but they're going hard against the regime in the central Syrian desert to enable that campaign against al-Qaeda in Idlib. Will that disrupt al-Qaeda? That remains to be seen. Um, ISIS is imposing costs. It's possible that that fight will heat back up. Um, But unfortunately, Syria is a target-rich environment for ISIS, and they gain traction by attacking a variety of enemies simultaneously. The the former Europe attack network maintained by, by ISIS in Syria, what about this one? Sure. So from what we can tell, there is still elements of the external operations wing inside of Iraq and Syria. I don't think, um, this is actually a good question for further study, but I don't think that ISIS is prioritizing using Iraq and Syria to continue to support the global attack network. We actually have indications that ISIS shifted outside of Iraq and Syria external attack nodes to places like Libya, to Afghanistan, to Somalia, Um, in order to diversify that footprint and actually thereby reduce the vulnerability that they had in Iraq and Syria to prioritize the new insurgency in that terrain and leveraging their global presence actually to sustain the the global attack network. Hans, could you add on this, please? Right, yes. So, I mean, there are two aspects to keep in mind. First of all, groups like the Islamic Movement of Uzbekistan and the East Turkestan Islamic Movement have these names for a reason, right? So there is no local focus on Afghanistan. This is actually... Um, all uh, seen as a hinterland for eventually moving up north. So there is a clear continuing regional threat. The second point, until there is uh, the, the rise of, of the Islamic State, a significant amount of discovered and foiled and actually happening attacks in Europe uh, had some links back to Afghanistan. So there was always this attempt to, to conduct uh, uh, attacks in Europe. This may research, right, now that, that uh, the more comfortable, easier to travel to, better accessible uh, training camps in Iraq and Syria are no longer accessible, this is certainly a second option. It's the harder country to, to travel to. Uh, at the moment, as I said, luckily we didn't see this great, uh, huge trek of foreign fighters going back to Afghanistan, but that doesn't mean that the attention of al-Qaeda in Afghanistan has changed in any way, that this is about attacking the West. It's not about attacking um, uh, the, the Afghan government primarily or even the Pakistani government primarily. It's about primarily carving out a safe space 
to conduct the global jihad as much as possible. So while I wouldn't see an immediate threat, um, it really depends on the level of control that the Afghan government can maintain with the help of the international community in Afghanistan um, that will determine how much the threat is. Um, because it's very tellingly that the one thing the Taliban consistently continue to refuse is what normally should be the easiest of all uh, of all uh, demands from the international community, if they are really believing that they not want Afghanistan to be a haven for, for global terrorism, is to separate themselves clearly with these words from the Al-Qaeda network. That's the one demand the Taliban continue to, uh, to, to, to deny. And um, I'm keeping suspicious why this is so incredibly hard for them if their, their, their statement which they make instead of it, saying we will not allow Afghanistan to be to be uh, used as, as a haven of global jihad. Well, when the, why don't you separate from the leader of global jihad then, vocally and publicly, and that's what they refuse. So there may be some questions on, on the believability of that statement by the Taliban. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I think the most positive news came from, from you, Aaron. Is there no threat to Europe from <laughs> deriving from <laughs> North Africa, please? <laughs> Yeah, there was only somebody uh, arrested in Germany today and, uh, you know, t uh, eight Tunisians arrested in Italy uh, the, uh, last week, I think. So, uh, yeah, I mean, there are still, uh, you know, threats from expat communities or uh, what have you um, in Europe from those from, I mean, if you look at most of the jihadi networks in Europe, um, a lot of them are from Moroccans, Algerians, and Tunisians, so it's definitely there. It's just not happening in their own region because they don't have the capacity or capability to carry out the same type of operations in Tunisia and Libya as they did from 2011 to, say, 16, 17. But if you look at uh, the history of the movement from North Africa prior to 2011, a lot of their activity was actually in Europe. So I wouldn't be surprised if you continue to have it. It just won't be sort of formalized under a group name necessarily, but more networked approach or small cell type of approach. Um, so uh, it's definitely not there. And if conditions change in, say, in Libya, which is certainly possible as we've seen things change there rapidly over the last eight or nine years on a number of occasions, um, you know, IS was directly involved in the Manchester attack and helped guide um, uh, the, the truck attack in uh, Berlin on the Christmas market. Um, so they're not against external operations and they've conducted two ones that were actually successful, um, which illustrates also that IS is interested in this, not just from Iraq and Syria, but anywhere. Um, um, so that's something to think about too. Uh, Stick, you mentioned yesterday when we discussed that from your point of view there is only a threat to uh, U.S. or European installations inside Africa. Is, is this the case? Um, yes, uh, we have uh, some incidences uh, historically. We had the uh, Shebab sympathizers trying to launch an attack against Holsworthy Barracks. Uh, that's a long time ago, 11 years ago. And we actually saw the Shebab at the time that actually they tried to discourage this. Uh, Shebab has a kind of doubleness. They always hit in the region uh, and they always hit against strategic partners in relations to some of the other foreign interventors inside Somalia. Uh, and the other organizations are also relatively regionally focused. Uh, but there is a lot of Western investments uh, in, in those regions. Um, there is definitely uh, a plus for these uh, organizations propaganda-wise uh, if they hit against these Western targets at the regional level. So that's there, and as I said when I did my presentation, uh, also if you go to the Harakat al-Shabaab, who is probably the most complex of the organizations and the most advanced when it comes to its propaganda, it still has a global propaganda reach. It still comments upon people uh, and items and uh, events happening in South uh, Asia and in the Middle East. And they still encourage attacks through their global propaganda in the West, but it doesn't seem like any of these organizations are actively planning for it. It's rather a local focus, but they are paying attention to the global struggle, and if they can attack Western uh, targets in the region, they will do so because it get, grabs them attention internationally, and that's what they need. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. My, uh, 
almost final questions. We discussed uh, Syria and, and Iraq uh, in, in, in detail now. Um, there was always a strong security concern uh, regarding uh, ISIS uh, vilayats for, for Israel uh, from the Sinai Peninsula or, or even the, the Gaza territory. How is the situation there right now? How did the military defeats in Iraq, Syria in 16 and 17 affect the affiliates there? Um, Dr. Azani. Okay, first of all, before entering into the uh, problems, security problems of Israel, what is the threat regarding Israel from all these uh, groups, I want to finish my argument regarding the previous questions uh, about the uh, level of the threat that we should uh, address when it comes to the global jihadists. We need to bear in our mind that their way of thinking is carried out a war until the judgment day, in their eyes. So they never close these component until they achieve their goals in their eyes. So the uh, motivation is always, there, uh, is always there. And I have here Professor Ganor that you say, not only motivation, they have operational capabilities. So when they have motivation plus operational capabilities, they continue to uh, operate. So regarding Israel, we are in a very unique situation. We are in a very unique situation because we are surrounded by uh, uh, a jihadi terrorist groups that all of them have the same common denominator. The common denominator is erase Israel from the map. So we need to build, uh, as I mentioned before, we need to build our security system based on uh, capabilities to counter the threat from all over uh, the uh, component. The most a uh, dangerous uh, a component of these uh, uh, issues, that they are, you know, managed by the Iranian Al-Quds Force, Hezbollah in the north, uh, militias, Shiite militias in Syria and in Iraq, uh, Hamas and other uh, Palestinian uh, groups that supported by uh, uh, Iran, and also you can take from Yemen the Houthis, so we are surrounding by a group once supported by Iran, and the global jihadists always, when they have, when they see that there is a trend in operations against Israel by the jihadists, they uh, uh, also enter into this field and uh, promoted this kind of threat uh, uh, against Israel. So from the Israeli side, you need to build your capabilities to counter and to uh, secure your borders in the north, your borders in the south, uh, infiltrating uh, uh, a group from uh, a, during these borders to carry out an attack in Israel. So it's the idea is uh, and to understand and to build a different uh, uh, a structure of plan against different uh, enemies. Because the global jihadist is not the same threat like Hezbollah, because Hezbollah has a missile and the global jihadist is operating in a different way. So you need to be prepared to protect your land from different uh, threats and different kinds of threats, okay? This is our situation. Until now, we are doing it uh, very well. I hope that we will continue. Thank you. Thank you very much for, uh, for this uh, final assessment in regard to Israel's uh, security again. To my own surprise, we managed to be somehow in time. I would like to thank our brilliant speakers once again, uh, in particular for sticking to this very neat timetable. Thank you so much. Neil's lucky the moderator wasn't an Israeli. That's why we finished on time. Okay. Thank you very much, Niels, for a great job as a moderator and for the people on the panel, especially my good friend Eitan Azani. Okay, so here we are, exactly on time, actually, two minutes uh, ahead of time, 12.43. Uh, 